ICT for Education's interview series. Today we talk to Chris Nash uh, from Discovery Education. So Chris, tell us a little bit about your role at Discovery and uh, the sorts of things that you're finding uh, particularly pressing at the moment. Uh, good morning, Sarah. Yes, so uh, my name is Chris Nash. I'm the head of community at Discovery Education. I like to think of myself as providing the teacher voice back into the company and a company voice back out into the teacher community. So I'm a bit of a conduit between the two. I've been involved in education most of my life, um, teacher, university lecturer, local authority advisor, freelance for a number of years. Um, and my passion has always been ed tech. Um, it was, you know, the, I, I guess my earliest inspiration as a teacher in the classroom. Um, and I very much per, kind of pursued my career around developing my understanding of ed tech, which I guess um, has enormous amounts of relevance at, at this current time clearly um, sure. and uh, it, it's very nice to be in a position to be able to share I guess the experiences of the last 20 odd years of working in ed tech and and, and to share what I've learned and, and, and hopefully make a bit of a difference and an impact with our teacher community. Excellent thank you well talking about that teacher community as the teachers head into the new term what sort of challenges are they facing? Oh golly I, I think it's um I think it's slightly different from from the March uh, lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think the, the the biggest change is that the teachers and schools seem much more keen to engage with online learning and remote learning. I think there was a a, a much a bigger emphasis the first time round on just looking at ways to to get materials in front of pupils, whether that was digital or print or in any format. Um, now there seems to be a much more of a desire to engage with online and digital and remote learning um, but that comes with its own <laughs> issues and challenges and I think most of what I've experienced either from the schools that I support directly or the community of teachers that we engage with is just around getting children and families set up and configured and ready for online learning. I spent four days at the beginning of term sorting out logins probably <laughs> Uh, resetting passwords, making sure children had access, trying to work out why three children were accessing the same account, um, working out ways to gently try and, uh, uh, <laughs> what's, what's a polite way to say this, um, urge parents maybe not to be quite so present in their children's learning. Um, okay. So, you know, a, a lot of ways to engage with parents to try and get uh, a slightly more normal lesson focused class where the child's at the okay. centre of the lesson and not the parent. Um, so there, there, there have been some uh, different kinds of challenges this way, this this time round. Um, and, and another thing's like, you know, where do I find the mute button? Or how do I get my pupils to, to mute in, in, in a Zoom or, or a Google Classroom lesson? You know, uh, and, and, and then I, I guess it's just really trying to understand and, and, and learn the craft of online teaching because it's so different from being in the classroom. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I think in most situations when a teacher is underconfident, they'll resort to the same strategy, which is to talk. Right. Um, and, and we see this enormously. And, and what worries me is that we're falling into the same trap as teachers at this point as well. And I can see it from my wife who does online teaching, my friends who do online teaching, they seem to be doing an awful lot of talking. Okay, and, so they need uh, to do some awful, listening too. <laughs> yeah, now, a lot of directing, a lot of controlling, which again is understandable. Uh, in, in the early stages, you want to feel in control of the lesson and the easiest way for you to feel that you are doing that is to be always inserting yourself into that lesson. But of course, we know that children need time and space to learn effectively. They actually need to be able to work with their peers and collaborate with their peers to learn effectively. And, and that's without all of the social uh, side of things as well and the emotional yeah. support that pupils get uh, in, in support from each other mm. and I think the other challenging thing is <laughs> things like you know who qualifies as a key worker in yeah. terms of who and should be in my have, school yeah. Yeah. Um, because then uh, again the, uh, the other challenging situation is managing this hybrid learning scenario where you've got some children in class and you've got some children at home um, and if you don't have consistency around who's going to be in what location, it's very hard to plan effectively for those sessions. Okay, 
Yeah, that's a lot of challenges. So how can Discovery help with services, products, not just these kinds of things, but also helping the schools with inclusion and things like that? Absolutely. Well, I, I think there are a number of ways. I mean, for, for us, we're very excited to, to have our new platform, our new experience platform uh, rolled out to schools and communities up and down the UK. Um, it's, a, it's a massive change for us. Espresso has been a loved and trusted brand in schools for 20 years. Um, but to a certain extent, it's always been about one way delivery. It's about present, us presenting knowledge and information and ideas and creativity to the teachers and then on to the pupils. Um, there's been a massive monumental shift in our platform now. Uh, it's very much more around a two way dialogue. It's about uh, not just about consuming content. It's now about creating and accessing and sharing and collaborating um, and, and all those wonderful things you can do and benefit from from being on a good online platform. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, we're, as, as, as part of the rollout of the new platform, we also feel that professional development should be there and on tap and on hand for teachers um, to, 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 to access and, and to find new ways to engage with pupils digitally and find new ways to use digital resources in the classroom. So the new on, uh, PD features uh, of our platform are very exciting for us as well. Uh, we've got a new section called What Works Well, where we describe how to get the best out of digital resources in the classroom, the kind of teaching strategies that are appropriate to use with digital resources. Um, case studies from schools that have enjoyed using things uh, from the service like the news or video zone. Um, so that's uh, for us been a very exciting shift. Um, there are a number of other aspects that we support as well. So um, we're very hot and always have been on, on um, online safety agendas. So we have great resources on the platform for dealing with online safety and of course children are spending so much time online at the moment they really need that scaffolding and support for how to behave appropriately and how to behave safely um, so we've got all those wonderful resources we're particularly hot on fake news it's been an agenda that we've been working with for a couple of years now particularly as part of our new service um, so we've worked with the journalists at ITN to produce some really great resources and understanding how to tackle fake news in the classroom, um, how to know how to understand trusted sources of news and trusted sources of information. So those are really valuable resources at this time as well. Um, we launched a brand new health and relationships uh, product in line with the new RSE curriculum, um, which again at this point when the, the emotional well-being of families and children is at such a difficult point that having uh, extra resources to be able to um, scaffold really good conversations around friendships and relationships and what it means to be with them and what it means to be without them. Um, but then also tackling uh, discussions and topics that maybe slip under the radar on a, on a normal daily basis. Things that might not necessarily been picked up by the family what the, the would have been taught as part of the normal uh, PSHE curriculum or just discussion time circle time and things like that just having those discussion points for some of the more challenging topics or some of the more challenging issues that pupils may be facing but don't have an outlet for within their day-to-day -day, uh, reference points um, so we, we feel there's some really valuable stuff in health and relationships as well um, most importantly, it's having collaboration opportunities for pupils, pupils to feel connected again. I, I think we're all struggling with our mental health. Um, my own family, you know, with older children are finding it difficult with, without having their peers to hand, without having that, those support net mechanisms. So they're really important part of uh, uh, building out the right kind of tools for pupils and, and, and teachers and children to engage with. And then last not least, and this was something that came up uh, really heavily in the in, in the news yesterday around activity and, and, and the lack of activity amongst pupils over the last year. There's been a, a striking drop in physical activity and the impact of that it can be huge. Um, so we've had a, a long-term partnership with uh, Nike. We produced a program a couple of years ago called Active Kids Do Better. It's a free program uh, for, uh, for parents and children and schools to access. Um, we've got a series of really exciting uh, activities to keep children fit uh, and, and moving with some, some great dance routines and some really <laughs> kind of enjoyable motivational music. Um, that's all found on our active kids do better.co.uk website. Um, so it, we, we hope we're, we're offering something for all of the aspects of this really challenging time at the moment. Okay, that is a huge resource indeed. Tell me the name of the website again. Active kids do better. 
www.ghostbusiness.co.uk. Okay, thanks. I'll have a look at that. So going back, that's a huge amount of resources. What, what sort of apps are teachers looking at, particularly at the moment, particularly for teachers who aren't that familiar with, you know, online and digital? Uh, what sort of apps are a good start? Well, of course, you know, the, 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 the key ones have been things like Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams as, as kind of the learning environments. They, they've been really powerful. Um, Seesaw has been another popular one as well. It seems to be very much at this point, the key thing is about communication and having good tools for communication and understanding how to get the best out of those. Um, and that extends to platforms like Flipgrid, which seem to be uh, becoming really popular as well. If people aren't familiar with uh, Flipgrid, it's a video sharing service designed for education, designed for schools, um, that really seems to be taking storm at the moment. So. Um, it, as I said, it really seems to be about that communication, that need to communicate. Um, and of course, other things, you know, good, good online platforms like Scratch and Purple Mash have been particularly popular as well. Um, so definitely communication is key as, as, as part of those tools. Um, one thing that really surprised me uh, initially, and I, and I think we have a really good understanding now, is that there was a lot of talk at the beginning of lockdown that this was finally going to be the age of virtual reality. In education and it was really going to kick off and of course we haven't we couldn't uh, we couldn't have a more opposite polarized situation where really pretty much everyone's ignored virtual reality at this point um it doesn't really seem to be having any kind of impact i i can understand why it's the same reasons we've always said it's um not necessarily the easiest situation to control in the classroom where you've got groups of children inside headsets um that presents its own behavioral management uh, uh, issues there's also um, really a, a lot of unknowns around the health and safety uh, around VR at the moment and whether that's appropriate to bring into the classroom. And then of course you've got COVID and <laughs> the appropriateness of sharing headsets around it's not on. is it's not current on. time. Um, but there are, there's a lot more interesting things like augmented reality. Um, and I'm particularly keen in this space as well and some of the, the augmented reality content that's out there, you know, whether it's from Discover Education or just the simple models that you can find in Google. Google have a wonderful series of uh, free to access uh, augmented reality models that you can just type into your phone browser and access directly on your phone. Uh, what I'm particularly keen in is this, this opportunity for potentially very powerful shared experiences. So we're, we're, we're losing the opportunity to go out on field trips and to have object handling experiences and to deal with physical objects. Um, there really is very limited opportunity for that to take place in a remote learning scenario, unless you have something like augmented reality, where you can present a shared experience to, with them, mm. to them. So they can all access potentially the same model and interact okay. with the same model of a beating heart or a Roman centurion or a water cycle. And they can discuss it in real time at the same time and have a very powerful shared experience. So I think, um, it, 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 it's trying to invent new ways to get children thinking together and talking together again. Um, and as I said, things like uh, augmented reality seem to be uh, really uh, um, uh, helping out with that scenario. Okay. And how do you see, hopefully, when everybody does get back into the classroom, how do you see these things sort of getting back into the classroom? Is it going to be easy or is that going to be difficult because everybody's learned the digital way? How, how do you see taking discovery back into the classroom for teachers? Really interesting. I mean, I've worked with schools for years around this digital economy and, and, and looking at ways to help the school move forwards on their digital journey. Uh, and to a certain extent, there were, uh, there were some wins there were some things that kind of made sense to teachers but on the whole the core of it this this notion of what I'm now calling digital first this is this idea that you start with a digital lesson and then you're always going to be able to reach more people hadn't really cottoned on now I'm really starting to see teachers understanding what this means um, there, there are teachers that I support who are actually not looking forward to getting back to the norm they're really enjoying the digital way of teaching. They feel more in control. They feel they're able to talk more to the, the, the pupil's natural way of working and the pupil's natural language. Um, so they're, 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 I guess there, there is a big dichotomy between those that are really now fully on this digital journey um, and, and, and those that are still a little bit further back. How are they going to uh, enable this powerful digital journey in the classroom? And as I said, I, th I think one of the key things around that is understanding this digital first notion of designing a lesson. If you design it from the digital aspect, first and foremost, using digital content, digital platforms to disseminate it to your pupils, um, 
you're not losing any of that in person part of the lesson because you're, you can still be there and present in front of the pupils and sharing that knowledge and information. What you are doing is you're allowing more people to engage, whether that's because digital is more familiar to them and they're more comfortable with it, or because they're in a remote situation and they're not actually able to access that lesson physically and be physically present in that lesson. This gives them an opportunity to engage in the same lesson. And then of course, you've got all the wonderful uh, accessibility tools that are now available on digital devices that are able to do text to speech and vice versa uh, and just allow more people to engage in those lessons regardless of their ability levels or their um, their needs etc um, so yes digital first that, that that's my big thing that's what, what what I think we need to really uh, start driving forward when we get back into the classroom and then of course uh, really understanding the impact of what happens when you remove things like PSHE and well-being from the curriculum? What happens to the, the, the pupils uh, if those things are not dealt with? So I think there'll be a massive increase in things like PSHE um, and pupil well-being and teacher well-being as well. And of course, the biggest thing of all is teacher community. You know, the teachers wouldn't have got through this without support from each other. Um, so I think we're going to see an increased demand and need in teacher community, teachers sharing information with each other, teacher platforms, that whole inspiration. I came from a culture in the 80s and 90s of CPD first. You know, every teacher was expected to attend CPD every half term. Um, and this has been eroded over the over the last 10 years. Um, getting back to that need to connect with your fellow teachers and share ideas and inspiration and motivation with your fellow teachers, I think is just going to be something we, we need to drive through this next stage. Okay, that sounds great. And thank you. So just to uh, finish off, three pieces of advice for these teachers who are working remotely, as you say, some finding it easier than others. What to, three pieces of advice, please. Well, the, the, the number one for all teachers uh, and the number one skill that all teachers need is patience. <laughs> just having that extra bit of patience, whether it's communicating with parents, and biting your lip because you're not, not particularly happy with an interaction. Um, patience around the technology, patience around pupils getting used to being in an online and a remote situation. So absolutely patience first. Second one would be, I think I hinted to it at the beginning, don't talk too much. Don't resort to that, 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 uh, that, that, that trap of teaching when you're unsure and uncertain and just talk your whole way through a lesson. Children still need that time and space to explore, to invent, to create, to collaborate and share and communicate their ideas. So the voice should be equally coming from the people as it is from the teacher. And then lastly, <laughs> have fun. Try and enjoy <laughs> it. Try and see the fun side of, of these remote teaching situations and inject some of that into those classroom scenarios. The, the kids need to, need to want to get up in the morning to come to these lessons. They need to want to turn on that camera so they can see the teacher and their peers face to face and enjoy that social side of learning as well. And that will only come through if the teacher's prepared to take a few risks and have fun with the class. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. And as we uh, said at the top, uh, Chris is from Discovery Education and you can find out all the resources that Discovery has online as well as an active uh, website, which Chris tells us that one once more. Activekidsdobetter.co.uk. Active. Activities for the classroom, for the garden, for the living room even. Lovely. Okay. So thank you very much, Chris. And thank you for everybody, to everybody for listening. That's it for today. Thank you.